Oh, you, you can't see me either. Here I am as I find my switcher. Hang on. I may have to bounce out of here uh, to get Ooh, this back. I never like when you do that. I know. Just a little bit flaky, isn't it? Just uh, so you'll know, I have a couple of uh, shots that we're going to be showing. And this is this is a live demo. Great. Live demo. And what I'm going to ask you to do is talk. I'll ask you some questions about this. You can strip on the right, by the way. You know, the thing on the bottom that's kind of blocking my view anyway of the of this uh, the app. There's a film strip icon at the lower right. If you click that. You will no longer see the. You can get rid of the film strip to see the rest of the app. Just so you know. Okay, Randy, we're good to go. We can okay. I'm going to turn on the audio, which is at vuc.audio. So we're live on that. Um, Zip DX. The recording is on on the audio. So we're going to ask everybody to. Keep the noise down while Michael does the pre-roll, and then we will be live on YouTube. <coughs> Great. Welcome to the bleeding edge of IP communications. This is the VUC. We're located at VUC.me. As usual, our thanks go out to Simwood.com. Simwood can turn any developer into a telco. Our host at Telephony is from OnSip.com. Where would we be without ZipDFC.me website on Bluehost.com? And our local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. Sounds like a dot-com revolution to me. So here's one more. TadSummit.com. For 2014, it's going to be in Istanbul. You should go check that out. For a 30% discount on registration, use FOVUC. Very cool. Thank you, Michael. And uh, we are so far, uh, so far, so good as far as the health of the system goes. We're live. This is VUC. 514. And uh, I think everybody knows everybody here except for uh, Georg. Georg, welcome to the VUC for the first time. Hello, Randy. Thanks for the invitation. We're really happy to see you. And uh, Michael and I have talked about uh, Authonic. How do you pronounce it, by the way? It's not Authonic for you, is it? It's Authonic. That's okay. Oh, okay. Authonic. Uh, we've uh, been. Uh, playing with it because Michael is uh, big into production and um, I know a little about audio. I'm not an engineer. Um, and that brings me to my first comment or question to you, which is how did you get started in this? Are you into engineering and audio or what, what is your background? Yeah, my background is audio engineering. Uh, actually, there is, I'm here from, I'm connected here from Austria from the south of Austria, and here is a nice study which is called audio engineering. <laughs> so it's quite obvious. And yeah, I also got a lot into machine learning and computer science and signal processing and all that. And Aphonic is somehow a mixture of all these, of all these fields. And it's also a um, very modern concept in that as soon as you started, I think the web services were first before the app, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's a pretty advanced thing. We're going to get into all the details of that in just a second. But before we do, I'm a little bit curious. I like to ask uh, people who visit us how they even got into technology in the first place. So at what age did your interest happen and, and how, if you don't mind sharing? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean... I was always interested in computers and also in, in music and recording and everything. So actually, I started as a kid to, to record some uh, music and also to record some, some radio shows. And yeah, so it was somehow always part of my, of my life. And I, I remember I, I played with the computer from my father and I crashed it a lot. <laughs> did everything so that he couldn't use it again. <laughs> but in the end, uh, you learn by doing, of course. 
Okay. Well, let's move into uh, actually the way I'm set up. I need to show the app first because I've got different windows set up. Let me just see if we can get this happening here. Uh, and I just need to do one little minor thing to try to show your reactions at the same time. So let's see if we can do this. It's not going to be. There we go. Now, uh, obviously, that's not ideal, but hopefully people can see what we're, what we're looking at here, which is the Authonic uh, application. This is something that you can go download. We'll get all to the links uh, also in a second. This is a fairly straightforward thing. And what I'm going to ask you to do, uh, Georg, is I'm going to do a little live demo. And I'm simply going to ask you to, I have a few questions, actually, that I need to know. So for this demo, we are going, I'm going to drop a file in. Well, well, let, let's let's start from the beginning. Let's let's actually let's actually state what our intention is. What's the purpose of the application? That's What's a good point. For? Actually, I am so drowning in this stuff that I forgot about that. Yeah. So here we've got this. We're going to put uh, Georg back on, and he's going to explain to us what they're actually trying to do. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm too much into this. Go ahead. Yeah. Um... As you already mentioned, so th this application was is only our second step. So we started with our web service, which is still the most featureful uh, application of, of of our company. So what do we, did we want to do? Uh, actually, we uh, did a lot of. I, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and there was always this problem of audio post processing. So which means uh, you have to equal the, the loudness of different speakers or then there is music and music parts should be in the similar loudness than speech parts. Then you have to filter something and do some noise reduction and all that. And afterwards you have to encode it into multiple file formats and use the correct metadata tagging for all formats and then you want to distribute it to YouTube, SoundCloud, your own servers or whatever. So this is all very complicated and most of the people did it do by hand back then a few years ago. And this is of course very, first it's very time consuming. So putting it to all servers and coding it in different formats and you have to check it again that everything is okay. And it's also, especially the audio processing needs some, some knowledge of course. You can't, you have to know what are compressors, what are limiters, what are noise gates, how to, how to uh, handle noise reduction and everything. So, which is, which is always very time consuming too, because there are lots of parameters. And so we thought, okay, let's try to automate all this and make it really simple. So we, we only have a few parameters, which, which you can um, change and everything else is done automatically so that basically if you record a podcast or a lecture at the university this was the second biggest uh, use case at the beginning then you just take the audio uh, send it to our system and then the workflow will run automatically and that's it so in the second step um, because of course many people asked us to also build a local version of the algorithms because they don't want to use the web service so this uh, is now this uh, local app, what, what you are showing to us here. And this is basically, there are the same audio algorithms in there. And it's just a very simple interface. Uh, so you don't see a lot of fancy graphics or anything else. So basically you just put your audio files in and then they are uh, processed in a, in a batch process. So if you, if you put 10 audio files in, then they will be processed in parallel. Okay, thank you for that. I'm sorry, I should have started at the beginning, and uh, now we've done that. Uh, if we're going to really start at the beginning, though, we should actually talk about, and I will put this um, this view up. Yeah, okay, so I've got the view of the app up, and the reason the app is a little bit easier to show, I want to show what the web uh, site does in a minute, because there's there are more things, as you said. Um, but the first thing to look at, this is the leveler. And the adaptive leveling is the biggest problem of all podcasts. Um, if you've ever listened to any podcast ever, those of you who are listening to this, you know that the most irritating thing about podcasts, other than people doing this, hitting the microphone like I just did, <laughs> uh, is 
this difference in level and you're talking to one person is uh, right up at the mic and they're talking like I am now. And then suddenly the guest is talking like this and you can't really hear what they're saying. Sure. And, really, and this is exacerbated by the fact that you've got some people wearing headsets. So they're up close okay. and personal. You got other people sitting back from their laptops using the built-in microphone and you can't get everybody to agree on what to do. So you have this problem of everybody comes at different levels and the more people you add, the worse the problem gets. Exactly. And so the first question, unfortunately, when I click on this selector, you can all see that I've got the mouse on the uh, target loudness. Unfortunately, just the way video works, at least on my system, if I click on this, you won't see all the selections. I'm going to put this up to very loud, which is the loudest, okay? Because I wanted uh, Georg to explain to us uh, LUFS. LUFS must be loudness, loudness unit something. Go ahead. Yes, exactly. So um, when we, there are there are multiple things in in the leveler. It's it's not only important to have similar levels uh, between segments in one file. It's also important to have similar levels or loudness between uh, different shows or between different files. And since a few years ago, there was no uh, no way to to measure loudness of an of an audio file. So you all know this, this may be in, in broadcasting or television, there was always, the, the commercials were always much louder and everything else was very quiet compared to the commercials. So actually a few years ago, the, the European Broadcast Union started to, to work on a standard on how to measure the loudness of, of audio. And why is this so complicated? Because uh, in, the, in the past, all, all people just used peak levels, these are just the very fast peaks of the audio signal, but they are not really related to how we, how humans perceive, perceive the loudness. So this is very complicated because the ear somehow integrates all the samples we, we know in a waveform. And then we have different um, perception and different frequencies. So the loudness is a little bit more complicated. And the funny thing is, uh, when we started with the Aphonic project, this loudness standard did not exist yet. So actually, we tried to invent a similar system. But then soon, I, I, I noticed all these loudness standards. And back to your question. So yes, this LUFS means loudness units, full scale range, so compared to full scale range. So this means zero LUFS would be the absolute maximum with what digital audio could do. And everything lower than that is, is more quiet. So for example, the, the loudness standard for TV in, in Europe is minus 23 LUFS. So this is now already in most of the European countries, this is already implemented. So all commercials and all feature films and everything must be at this minus 23 LUFS. So there are not so big jumps in level anymore. Then in the US, then they followed with a similar standard, which is minus 24 LUFS in this case. It's a little bit different. That's why here it's no gate. So there are various kinds of gates on how to measure this loudness, which is not very important. It's just a detail. And yeah, so there are some numbers uh, out there. And in, in the Broadcasting or mobile world uh, somehow was agreed to, to use minus 16. This is a little bit louder than the TV standard. This is, of course, not really, standard, not really a standard. So in, in the end, everything should be at the same level. This would be the ideal world. But of course, there are problems. For example, if you, if you use minus 23 with podcast and the problem is that all the mobile devices like the iPhones and Android phones and whatever, they have very low levels because um, they, they must have some protections for ear, for ear damages. So you cannot use that high levels. And if you, if you, if you take the loudness tunnels like in the television, then the signal could be just too quiet. And then you don't hear the speech anymore in, in the underground or in, in airplanes. So that's a little bit of compromise is this minus 16 LUFS, which is, by the way, also the similar loudness as Apple uses for the sound check system. And this is still, this is still a quite good value compared to before. 
and it assures that this was actually your question at the beginning it ensures that multiple files uh, have similar loudness no matter what's in there yeah as michael points out in irc uh, the nice thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from <laughs> yeah well, i'm going to go through this and so bad was this problem that they legislated it in the U.S. There's an act in, on, in, of Congress called the Calm Act that's all about legislating loudness between commercials and and, uh, and program material and television. And and even so, depending upon how old your hardware is, you may still find that it's it's a little too variable. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to go through this just a little bit, rather quickly, of course. I just wanted to touch on it, and actually this gives me a little bit of an education, too. The noise reduction amount, now we're not actually talking so much about re noise reduction, but it is there, so that's excellent. There's an auto parameter that I would suggest most people probably should use. Um, it's too bad you can't see all the different ones, but it goes from auto, it starts at three decibels, uh, I'm trying to look at the, I think I've got that. Yeah. Three now, what, decibels. What, what's the manner of noise reduction? What's the method of noise reduction underlying that? Mm, yeah. So, mm, so basically, um, noise reduction works like this. So we get an audio file, then this audio file is analyzed. So uh, we first see where are different background segments. So for example, if I speak now here in this room, I have a quite low background level, I guess, and a quite steady noise. Then I go outside and there is a totally different background situation, birds and cars and everything. So first uh, we have to segment the, the audio file into different uh, segments of background noise characteristics. Then we do a uh, noise reduction in these segments. So this means, um, for example, if I'm speaking now, they're always short pauses between my my words and my sentences. So in these short pauses, I just take a little bit of the audio where there is only noise. And then I take a few of them. These are called noise profiles. So I, I want to, to have an example of the noise so that I know how it looks like. And then you can imagine, um, then somehow, it is sub subtracted, only this noise part is subtracted from, from the audio signal, so that basically only the audio signal remains and the noise signal is removed. This, of course, can lead to artifacts, you, you all know that, so bad noise reduction always introduce, introduces some, some bad sounds, uh, it's called musical noise. So, and uh, therefore we also have um, and somehow classifiers which decide how much noise reduction is, is actually necessary. This is this auto parameter you showed us before. So if you do it, if you set it on auto, then we will decide automatically how much noise reduction is possible. And otherwise you can set it to a, to a fixed value, then it will be applied manually. So we try to not to too much noise reduction because personally I don't like that. So it's better to reduce less of the noise and not have all the artifacts. Yeah, it's really a, a last resort. Um, mm. Most people agree that you should try to make a decent recording without the hum and the noise. I mean, if you have hum, it's probably a bad cable or bad ground and that's something that needs to be fixed. But uh, on the other hand, it very often, you get a new piece of equipment or something or a new cable and there is noise and there's nothing you can do about it. So I guess the thing to do would be to try this facility and see how it works. Uh, I've messed with noise reduction uh, using, for example, Audacity. Everybody knows that program. And it's definitely a trade-off. You are not going to get excellent noise reduction. Uh, I don't know how well things work when you have you know, a $40 million studio, but in general, in this kind of software, it's not going to be great. It's going to be a compromise between a couple of things. Can we um, move to the maximum peak level, which is actually fairly easy to understand? In the the auto, um, I guess one question would be, what? Let's see. It's, it says because it may not be readable. It says maximum true peak level of pr processed audio files. Use auto for reasonable value, which one would assume uh, the selected target. Use minus one uh, BTP. For EBU 128, we're getting to the standards again. Um, I would suggest people use auto. When would you not use auto for maximum peak level? 
Well, this is just the definition. So uh, different standards have to use different peak levels and you just set it to the standard you want. If you, if you, if you don't know what this is, then just let it on automatically. So what this means, uh, this just at the end, the audio file will be uh, put through a limiter so that we don't have clipping in the output. Mm -hmm. So this is the maximum, this is the threshold of the limiter actually. So no peak will be over this value. And uh, so this is a true peak limiter. This means if you, if you use a normal limiter, then you have this, uh, the peaks are what you see in your waveform. And the true peak limiter, the problem is that if you convert the audio signal from digital to analog, again, from digital to analog, then there can be peaks between your samples. And you don't see this in your waveform because uh, you don't have these peaks between your samples. So therefore, this is a true peak limiter. This means that the signal gets oversampled before. So you can also select the oversampling, I think. No, you can't. Um, oh yeah, yeah, you can select it here in the next. And this means there is four times oversampling, so or eight times oversampling, so the signal gets oversampled four times. So you see the peaks which are between the actual samples, and then this peak uh, is taken for for the limiter as a measure for the limiter. So it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit uh, more advanced. Okay. And uh, this is going to be fairly brief, and we'll, then we'll move to the web. Um, the output format, there's a choice. I'm going to read these because uh, the fact is I can't show this, the selector the way yeah. video works. So it's wave, WAV, WAV float. But maybe before you go to the output uh, formats, maybe we should speak about the leveler, which is actually the most important algorithm for most of the people. <laughs> so uh, the leveler, you see the leveler at the... Um, main page so maybe if you if you close the preferences yeah we'll go back to that uh what happened then actually it's not much to 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 select there it's you can just turn it on or off so you see here the adaptive leveler yes and what does this do we we discussed the target loudness before mm -hmm. the, the target loudness only ensures that um the 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 somehow the, the medium loudness of the file is similar to the medium loudness of another file. But now we have the problem that within one file, there can be segments which are very loud or segments which are very quiet. So therefore, this, this adaptive leveler is here. So this adaptive leveler ensures that uh, different segments in, in one file have a similar loudness. And how does this work? This is this is uh, the most complicated thing actually, because um, if you send a, a sound file to us, then it gets analyzed first. So at the beginning, we, we have to check uh, where are music parts and where are speakers, because um, in music parts, you, it's not good to, to make such an aggressive adjustments in levels, because there are always soft parts and loud parts in music and you don't, oops, sorry. <laughs> and you don't want my mouse noise reduction. Yeah, and you don't want to destroy the the dynamic of the music. But in speech, of course, if you have multiple speakers and they have a big difference, you want hard uh, corrections of these levels. So then there is another problem if if nobody is speaking, for example, and there is only some background some background going on, some background sounds. You of course don't want to amplify these sounds. You know this from some bad automatic gain control systems, then everything gets very loud and it's just noise. So we always have classifiers which decide uh, what to do or what not to do. So they see if there is just background noise or there are speakers and so on. And then at the end, it ensures that the loudness is somehow consistent. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay. Um, I also there's there's a the gating, which I don't think you mentioned uh, the LFU LUFS gate. We're not on that screen right now, though. Let me mm -hmm. see. Uh, yeah, I have to bring up the preferences. 
Yeah, this is something, as I said before, this is very special parameter only for some, some standards. Um, this is just, there are different ways to calculate this LUFS value, this loudness uh, unit value. And as you see below, it's it's called ITUBS 1772. Then there is also now 1773 and so on. And they have some minor differences like these gate values. This gate actually just means that, um, that very soft parts are not included in the measure. So for example, if, if, if we speak and then uh, if I speak and then I make a pause, a longer pause, and then I speak again, then this pause, uh, the loudness of this pause won't be included in this measure. And there are different gate values for that, but that's very special. Right. So you can choose between auto, no gate. I'm going to uh, dispatch this and go back to the other thing, which is here. There we go. So the big demo, now we've, well, I guess we need to cover, uh, we, we mentioned noise and hum reduction. Um, I don't think you touched on high pass filter. Now, everybody knows what that is, but what was the idea? What is the purpose of having a high pass filter without having a whole EQ set up? Or, mm -hmm. or like what kind of, what kind of, what would be a circumstance where that would be deployed? Because I can think of sort of rumble reduction, but I'm not sure how you see that you know in a modern context it used to be with turntables you had a lot of low frequency oscillation mm -hmm. sometimes yeah exactly so this is uh, of course mostly uh, usable for for speech recording so what this does uh, it is um, a high pass filter just for the for those who don't know just removes the low frequencies and lets the high frequencies through so that's why it's called high pass filter and most of the time Mm, you don't need all these very low frequencies. These are just some, some noises or whatever. And so this the problem is only that you have to, basically you can switch it on all the time, but the problem is that you have different, you, you have to choose the right frequency on where to remove the lower sounds. So in music, you should not remove all the low sounds because there are bass players and and so on which have very low frequencies which must be inside of the of the recording in speech of course our voice has not such a low frequency so you can uh, remove all the low frequencies and so this only analyzes the sound first and sees okay here is music here are speech with a high bass frequency or with a low bass frequency and then it will cut the the frequencies below below the target signal. Is it is it um, sensitive to uh, different kinds of voice? So for example, um, we happen to be using Jitsi Video Bridge, which passes audio using the Opus codec that can get down to 50 hertz if somebody's got a, a really Darth Vader kind of thing going. Um, so is it able to, to accommodate that? Or is it is it is it context content aware then? I guess it is, yes. right? Okay. Of course. Yeah. Because a lot of regular telephony below 300 hertz, you got nothing, which is why everybody sounds like a Smurf over a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we ready for the big exciting uh, execution of this file? <laughs> the result? I'm not going to play it because, as I told Michael earlier, there's no point in playing the audio because we're going through several different bridges and you wouldn't hear what it is. But we can show it. So I'm going to click on this. Is a rather pretty short file, by the way. So. There is a soft voice in the beginning and a louder voice in the end. I'm going to click on process all files. We're seeing uh, the gauge. It's it's uh, doing the analysis and then it's going to do the reencode. Incidentally, it's very... available for Windows, Mac, and is it Linux as well or just Windows and Mac? The two apps. Well, we develop it. We develop it under Linux. <laughs> But so far, um, we did not manage to, to create a good distribution format, which is uh, runnable everywhere. So it's really a mess, unfortunately. And there's, and there's the, stats. Yeah, there's a complete, uh, I don't know that we want to go through every one of these, but they're fairly <laughs> obvious, I think. Is there anything that we need to point out in your opinion, Michael? In particular, anything that puzzles you there? Garg would know more than I. Something we should highlight here before we look at the waveform? 
Yeah. Well, there are there are many parameters which are part of this loudness standards. So, for example, LRA, this means loudness range. Or then there are various values like maximum momentary loudness or maximum short-term loudness. They are in some specifications. You have to ensure mm -hmm. some specific values for that. But I guess for the general people, it's not so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting. I think I'll look at it later. Um, I watched a few of these, but I wasn't really paying attention to what it was. The main thing you want to look at is the result, and we're going to take a look at that now. Now, this is just a. This is not. Uh, this is specific to the file that I just analyzed, and the point that needs to be said here is that on the top you see the original uh, mono, and you notice that the so-called soft voice before the louder voice, the uh, biggest peak in the beginning is at minus five. It happens to be, it's asymmetrical too, by the way. But anyway, this, uh, if everybody can see that peak and you go down and look at the same place in the processed file and you can see that indeed this is down to, um, I can't even read that. It's almost, it's about 0.8 or something. The point is that obviously this signal is louder and it definitely sounds louder. And the whole point of this exercise really, we didn't, uh, I did not use any kind of filtering or anything else. The whole point of this, though, was that the first voice is softer, noticeably softer than the second. And the idea is to make that comfort level come up by making the two voices sound similar. Now, they don't look identical, Georg, and I wondered about that. But I'm... Well, you know, you should, you should never judge the audio by looking at the waveform. Exactly. I was going to say there are two things at play here. One is our hearing. The other is who through the waveform, that happens to be audacity, but I mean, we don't know their algorithm for drawing it. So the point is, when you listen to this, I guess I'm testifying here, <laughs> when you listen to this, it does sound right. Whereas um, the first one up on the top definitely was quite noticeably softer, the first voice. So with that, uh, we can pause for questions while I move to the web thing, because I'd like to show that and I need to find it in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I found. Um, we'll, go ahead, Michael. We we'll take some questions, but I, I should like to uh, to ask something about timing. Uh, when did you guys get started with the project? Uh, and the reason I ask is we've been doing this call for about um, uh, a long time. Well, 514 episodes. <laughs> seven, <laughs> over seven years, almost yeah. eight now. And in in the earliest days, we were doing um, well. If you go back about 120 episodes ago, we were doing audio only using a, a normal telephone conference bridge, publishing a podcast, and all was good. But the service that we were using didn't have any built-in post-production capability. And so we started using something that was from the Conversations Network called the Levelator that was a sort of an automatic thing. I think that was a kind of a precursor to what you guys were doing. Uh, so were you aware of that when you started uh, Alphonic? Yes, exactly. Uh, we were aware of that. So to your question, so we started, uh, actually, I started with the project, I think, in 2000, end of 2010, beginning of 2011. Mm -hmm. And then the first, uh, the web version came online in March 2012. And yeah, I did know the level later before, but I was actually very surprised when I uh, one podcaster told me about this program and I was an audio engineer already back then and I was very surprised that I never heard of it before <laughs> because all the audio people don't use these tools it seems it's well, more in the podcasting it's, it was more in the podcasting scene and yeah then this this program was of course very inspiring because it was actually an offline tool and usually all audio, all professional audio software are online tools. So this comes from the fact that most audio software is distributed as plugins and plugins work in digital audio workstations and they always have this online concept. So a small buffer of audio comes in and the small buffer comes out again. So there is not really a lot of professional audio software which, which works offline. And this got me thinking um, because uh, many algorithms, like our leveler, for example, can be built much better if you do it in an offline way than doing it in an online way because you can analyze the audio first and can go through multiple passes to, to process the audio. 
so yeah, uh, I looked at this level later and was it was really great, but it has had some problems that it always destroyed music parts because uh, it just smashed the dynamics in it. And yeah, also if you have some background sounds, if you had bad luck, they could be they could be amplified quite a lot. So, yeah, and, and it was very clearly designed for voice because they were a podcast network and the only music that they had would be to, and, and their production workflow included a pre-pending an open and, and a pending a close at the end, but that was after the level later process. I, we found it limited. We, we actually still use it a little bit, but we found it limited because it only worked on uncompressed wave files. So, and well, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then they, they went away. They were, you know, that whole project went away and, and they were open source but unsupported. But thankfully, they at least made clear um, all of the thinking and the algorithms behind the software. So, um, But you were able to extend that quite a lot and uh, particularly um, the ability to set up automated workflows is just fantastic. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. And um, so you say that the, the web-based version is more popular or more in use or more more feature rich or how does that play out as I'm, I'm curious as to why the two yes so one one important thing is why we actually started with the web version is that um, most audio software producers have the problem that they don't know how their users use the software the software and they don't know the results so we on our web version, of course, see what people are doing with it. And uh, we, we see uh, when there are problems. And because we have a lot lots of classifiers in, in our software, and they always, if you have the data on our servers, then they can learn from this data, of course, and improve the algorithms. So this is, is a much better feedback loop which, which is just not possible if you just do a desktop software because you get never the audio back, which is produced by your software. And so this is this is really a key part because um, uh, when we release a new algorithm, then it gets approved a lot in the in the first few months. So this is just very essential. Excellent. And, and have you given any consideration to releasing some of the tools or the algorithms that you have deployed in the application or the web service within a VST for somebody who wanted to automate their offline production within a workstation environment? Uh, the reason I ask is uh, it's going to hard to be hard for me to say this without sounding like um, I'm being condescending, but I see a lot of podcasters who will, um, you know, have very impassioned debates about which microphone they use that makes them sound fantastic. And they go to really, it reminds me of when I was a, you know, a 12 year old child debating which hi-fi sounded better uh, with my, my classmates. Uh, they, they go to a, a great amount of trouble to do things that really don't have that much consequence when they're, and they go to a lot of post-production in fact, I, I've heard of people who literally make local recordings and then they collect up the local recordings and then they go into their editor and they edit the podcast back together as it happened live because they want to have uncompressed audio uh, to, to start with. And I'm like, wow, that's a massive amount of post-production when in fact, um, if they were just to do a live recording, whether it be via Skype or Hangout or Jitsi or talkie.io or any any means you have right and then feed it up through a phonic they could get something that's very very close and maybe even better because you're automating all the complexities of their post-production but do you see this as well because it's a sort of this crazy amount of people want to do things manually versus automate sorry there was a, there was a question in there somewhere but <laughs> uh, well if you if you have fun and doing the post production manually, why not? I mean, it's of course great. I think uh, Michael, uh, maybe your question was um, because you asked about VST that some of these people have that you were talking about have they're using very very high end editors, you know, that cost hundreds of dollars and that that can use VSTs. In which case, if there was an Auphonic VST, uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what I said before so that's the problem with vsd plugins that you 
they have an online concept, so you cannot implement offline algorithms with it. I have a I have an interesting idea for you, and I'm sorry to interject in the flow of things, but I'm going to do something that, that you'll see something going on here. Um, obviously, this is close to my heart. I'm an audio guy from old, and I only got sucked into TV because it was easier to make a living. Um, <laughs> so if you, I'm going to drag my audio mixer onto the screen, and you're going to see it. And this is a piece of software. Um, so. I'm, I'm, if the YouTube folks can see it, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can see it as well. Um, we see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whoa, hang on. I'm, I'm getting very confused now. Went to black now. Turn, turn that off. Turn that off. Going to here. Uh, I've confused myself. Going to the camera. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll go back to here. Back to Randy. And here. Okay. So um, anyhow, the audio mixer that I was showing you, the thing about it that makes it novel is um, it's sort of a software mixer, but it has hooks in it that I can plug VSTs into it. So while we use it for doing mix minus for things like this, we actually can, uh, in fact, um, we could plug an Alphonic plugin into it and, and have, to the extent that there's any, not the look ahead kind of stuff, but the, those parts that could be done in real time, we could actually do. Um, through a podcast like this, which would be sort of outstanding, I think. But just an idea. Yeah, but that's exactly the problem. I mean, VSD plugins only get a small buffer of audio, mm -hmm. and then they have to process it, and then they put it out. But we analyze the audio first, so we have to, we have to see a lot of it, mm -hmm. and therefore we can do much more in-depth processing, but it doesn't work in real time, of course. That's the drawback. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so, so that, I didn't think of. How, how, how much improvement do you actually get in, in terms of the, the audio output uh, over a, what would be a live podcast? Uh, well, you, it's just a completely different concept uh, because um, you can also, you could, of course, do it in real time. So if you have a small buffer of audio and then try to classify this buffer and process just small buffers, but of course, there would be much more errors because you have less data. For example, if you have now a speaker and then a next speaker or music, then we would, we would have to classify in very short uh, buffers. Is, is this now music? Is this now speech? Or is this noise or something else? So, And if you only look at these short buffers, the, the probability for an error is, of course, very high compared to if you look to the whole audio file and you can go back and forth and then decide, ah, okay, this is not very likely to be a speaker. So it's just, it's there are just more errors and you will just, maybe it's on, on, on some audio files, it, it won't matter. On some audio files, it, it will be much worse. So you cannot give an... And well, obviously, if you're not using music at all, for example, that um, that's a big difference. If you're using music, I think that this this idea of def defining what the content is, by the way, uh, is one of your more interesting features because uh, things like the levelator, for example, d as far as I know, at least, do not do that at all. So that's a very interesting point. I I would like to show um, the the web part because um, we don't want to run out of time before we do that. So. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that I, before I start this? Well, yeah. I, I have one question that I wanted to ask. It applies to both, I think, both the, the, the web front end and also the application itself. And that is that you, you said with the levelator that uh, you had to use uh, flat wave files. It's clearly you can use MP3s to feed into this as well. Are there any other formats that it, it will accept? Uh, what are phonic accept? Yes. Yeah, this um, basically the web version accepts most of the formats which are out there. So, because uh, we use uh, all all common decoders which are out there, that's no problem at the web version. But the desktop version does not support all formats. This is because of patent licensing restrictions, of course. So you can't use any you you can't ship any decoder. Right. Uh, we support. Um, this also depends on the platform because on Mac OS X you you have already lots of decoders in the operating system, so there we support most of the common formats. In Windows, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, you have to install Lame, 
additionally to decode mp3 files and um, there is no support for AAC files on Windows. Okay. As a funny uh, aside, by the way, Georg, uh, you and I <laughs> communicated on this. Uh, I found that my my lame version was from 2004 and it wasn't working, so I had to update it. Uh, yeah. That's a little caveat if anybody else uh, falls into that. Let's take a look at the web. Unless I'm going to pause uh, unless anybody else has anything pressing. Michael, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, um, I'm on the. I'm not doing this in order because, in fact, uh, one of the interesting things about the web part is that you can do presets, and these presets, I'm just going to go through them very quickly. And uh, Georg, you, uh, if you want to interrupt me if if I'm missing something, uh, there's a bunch of things you can fill out. Obviously, you can call the preset something. You can select. In fact, I should have gone to edit, right? No, that's okay. That's okay. Well, because I already have one here, and it would have been maybe made more sense to just grab it with edit. So I've got the I've named it so that I can find it. I'm not using intro and outro. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned that before, but you can do a very very time saving thing, which is to select a file, an intro file, and an outro segment. Uh, you can do this all as well on the app, by the way. Um, and so commonly, um, we do have intros and <laughs> lame, lame install. Yes, James. Yeah, you commonly do use the same intro as we did today, and you sometimes use the same outro. There's the, some of the basic metadata, the title. You can put a cover image. You can put the artist album. This is all like iTunes type or MP3 type um, metadata. I didn't, uh, I'm a little lazy, so I didn't put a lot of stuff in here. You put the, the genre, which is spoken word, the year, uh, the publisher, all of this thing. So this is this metadata, which actually can be a pain to fill out. And if it's always the same, that's a very nice thing. That is actually the most uh, time uh, saving thing is if you use now multiple output files, you, yep. you only selected MP3 here. Mm -hmm. But most of the podcasters in Germany, for example, they all use MP3, AAC, Org Warbase, Opus, and everything. And I'm adding that now. Yeah, so that you are compatible with HTML5, HTML5 players and, and everything. I'm adding um, Og and uh, Og Vorbis. You can also add Opus, for example, the new oh. audio codec. Uh, and there we go. So we got now we got four output. That's Thank you. That's excellent. I didn't even pay attention to that because we only have one. And now the problem is that all these formats have different metadata systems, and uh -huh. they are the metadata you filled in before is now mapped to all those different systems. Oh, so and it's and it's you mean it's validly mapped? Oh, that's excellent. Another yeah. important point. Can you go up a little bit? Sure. Oh no, sorry, that's not here in the preset. That's in the production. Yeah, when I was going to leave that. So the the point was simply to show that we're we're getting our basic stuff. This can always be changed. I'm not going to save this. It can always be changed when we go to our production. So we're, then, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe just open the production, then I will. I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit the production so that it says I'm gonna choose the preset. So what we were looking at before was called VUC demo. The preset is brought up. I need to select a file. We don't need to do this now, but we would normally select a file. The as we mentioned, the intro and outro. We're back to the basic metadata, which you saw a minute ago. And now you were saying Yes, now you can see uh Maybe you go a little bit down. Okay. Then uh, one important thing is also chapter marks, which you, which you don't use, I guess. No, so, but it's good to have that, yeah. Actually, all the German podcasters all use chapter marks, which is very convenient if you listen to it, because you see there are different topics. And it's, of course, much easier to search in, in it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Why is here standing unknown type? Yeah, this is the thing with Chrome that I have uh, badly adjusted because. Uh, okay, whatever. No, no, uh, that's yeah. not you. That's not you guys at all. That's on every website, and I need to fix that. It's it's a flag in Chrome. Okay, so and you can add chapter marks with URLs and images and so on, and these are of course all mapped to all output formats and so to AAC. Then you see it on your iPhone and also to MP3 and. Or Warbies and so on. Mm -hmm. And also, if you use now some external services, you can here select that you send the audio file straight to YouTube or straight to SoundCloud or to your own server. And you can see everything here. So it's quite a lot. Or to Dropbox, Libsyn, Blueberry, and so on. 
So then all this metadata is also mapped to YouTube and SoundCloud, and you can see the chapters and comments inside the audio file and so on. And even though we're kind of coming to the end, uh, I didn't mean to gloss over because these are some of the most important services. So I'm glad you... Uh, if, we, if we come to the end, I want to, to show you something new, which is quite, quite a big thing. Which we, which we released one week ago or two weeks ago. This is actually the multi-track version. If you go to a productions and... Production. Yeah. Now, right. we're not talking multi-track like 24-track, two-inch tape recorder. We're talking something else here, right? No, this is... Oh, okay. You, you're not... On, sorry. I will just explain it. So multi-track means... So, this is about audio algorithms. So before we just were speaking about um, the leveler, which just takes one audio file in, then processes it and gives one audio file out. So most of the time, if we record some shows like we are doing here, we are multiple speakers. So we could record, or most people do that, record the individual tracks of each speaker. And then uh, we could process the individual tracks and could do much better processing. This means because we know uh, when uh, someone is speaking in which track. And so it's, of course, much easier to do noise gating and noise reduction. And also we can um, remove the cross talk, which if you if multiple speakers record in one room, then the voice of one speaker is also recorded by the microphone of the other speaker. So uh, this, this results in an echo-like or reverb-like effect. So we can... Uh, reduce this reverb and all this echo in the sounds and yeah you are already at the web page there are some audio examples just listen through these and this is our latest these are our latest algorithms and they are very nice <laughs> and we are working on yeah on this is now. this is um this is an interesting thing and it's very um indeed it's uh it's very modern in which uh, different recording so you can process all various input files into this and your output file would be the proper optimized mix of these exactly yeah yeah that, that's excellent i hadn't even noticed it and that uh, of course um uh, is for people who have credits so now we're maybe we need to talk a little bit about the pricing models i'm not going to show those i did want to show one thing though real quick which is important which is this graphic which shows the address which is authonic.com slash audio under bar examples where you can go listen to these in fact i encourage everybody to go explore the site there's a lot of interesting stuff we were just a moment ago on i think here right no um this oh so it was on my okay <laughs> i lost it i was on the uh, proper web page but the point is anyway on the site there are all these different things including a preview of the audio the multi-track audio mm. sounds and i already listened to these a couple of days ago and so they're really good demos of that yeah that's our later thing and yeah so to, to take this cross context for just a moment i went to a great deal of trouble to do multi-track audio processing across a music library because you you really have to do that if you want to have uh, a long playlist of different tracks play seamlessly back and forth and not have the levels jump up and down and and because every CD is different and and so it, this has it has application um, broadly across all recorded sound. Yeah, but therefore you would not need the multi-track version, or? Uh, no, but it's sort of a parallel, an interesting parallel from music because you you end up having to put level tags in to ensure that as you go from one track to another, the level is playback and you, hopefully your player adheres to those level tags so that you don't end up with, you know, um, loud, yeah, loud there, are, there are various systems for that, like sound check or replay gain. Yeah, exactly. Michael, you um, you mentioned the um, the two hours or megs or something is free. Uh, I think that what we run uh, to clear this up, uh, Georg, the multi track requires credits, right? That's what that's the prompt I saw anyway. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there is no free multi track, correct? Um. Yes, um, there was multi-track was in a beta program for some month, but now this is actually the first thing which is not for free for everyone. So a little bit to the model. So we were free until this year, everything was free. 
And now we, we in, in June, we introduced a freemium model. So this means that two hours per month are free for everyone. And if you need more, you can buy credits for additional hours. Uh, yes, the multi-deck version is not the first thing, which is not free anymore for everyone. Because unfortunately, we have to get some money in. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have no problem with that delineation. By the way, I think that's probably a good idea. I'm I'm all for that. And the two hours, I don't, I can't really put my finger on the number of hours I would need. Um, I did uh, buy the license for the app, so I'll use. <laughs> I can use that. Won't use it for VUC because we're an institution. But I, I have another thing I do that has nothing to do with any association, and um, we'll use it for that. And it's yeah. it's it works well with the workflow as well. One thing that hasn't come up, and that is um, yet, is you're able to, uh, at least with the web version, you're able to extract audio from video files. Is that correct? And, and if so, are you able to lay them, lay the audio back, or does that have to be done separately? No, you can also process video files. So we just take out the audio of the video container, and the video won't be touched at all. And then the audio is processed and then put back into the container. So the video doesn't get decoded and encoded again, so it's just the audio. Oh, so, so I could take a YouTube clip and, and add like a hangout, a recorded hangout, post-process the audio and not have to go into my video editing software at all to touch that. That is massive. More people need to know yes. about that. And then you could export it to YouTube automatically, of course, <laughs> after the processing. That's a killer feature. That's excellent. That's excellent. Anybody else have any questions? Did someone follow the chat? I was not in there now. Yeah, we're 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 watching it. Uh, the, Andy, a couple of people have mentioned, including Andy, uh, about using it to adjust the loudness of, of telephony prompts, which is actually a pretty good idea. And that um, that would have to be at the um, I mean at the level of the people who are putting those files together. We're mostly about telephony, or very often about it. Um, any other? Was there another question that anybody had? I'm looking. I didn't see it. Transcodopus function, mostly comments, and they're they're positive. So, <laughs> ah, wait. Uh, James says which bits come with the basic and which bits are paid premium. We covered that, um, and that's about it. That's about it, I think. Plus, I think we did a pretty good job of not covering. You guys were on. Are you 